Well, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Let's talk about exposition and theology. Why should every expository preacher be a theologian? How would you address uh, that question? Let's start with you, Dr. Lawson. Oh, good. <laughs> so the question is, why or how? You, you pick. I'll just throw it out there. I feel like you have a preference. Well, every expositor would have to be a theologian. Um, I mean, even R.C. Sproul has written a book, Everyone's a Theologian. Hmm. I mean, everyone believes something about something related to God, whether it's correct or incorrect. So every preacher, period, is a theologian. He's either uh, a well-crafted theologian, well-studied theologian, or he's a very shallow, superficial or inaccurate theologian. Mm. Um, the Bible itself is filled with sound doctrine and theology. Uh, Paul referred to it as the whole counsel of God. Uh, Jude referred to it as the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. Uh, Paul referred to it in, in Romans as the standard of sound words, um, and in Timothy as well. Um, Acts 2, it's the apostles' teaching. So it, it would be impossible to preach through the Bible or a portion of the Bible as an expositor and not preach theology, uh, the truth about God and who God is, his names, his attributes, his existence, his triunity, his eternal decree, um, his names, his works. It would be impossible uh, to preach the Bible and not preach the truth about God, the study of God. Um, the chief purpose of the Word of God is to reveal the God of the Word. And so, and then every other area of systematic theology is connected to theology proper. Um, and so, it, it's, it's, it's incumbent upon the expositor to be a theological expositor. And as Martin Lloyd-Jones Martin Lloyd has famously said, what is preaching? It is theology on fire. So if your preaching does not have theology, it's not going to be preaching that's on fire. And then Lloyd-Jones said it must come through a man who is on fire, that this theology and this doctrine has affected you it has raised your affections for God, uh, for the glory of God, the greatness of God. Um, and so what you would want someone to say after you have preached is not, wow, that was a great sermon, or you're just a great preacher. You would want someone to say, Pastor, what a great God we have. Yeah. Uh, ever since you came to be our preacher and pastor, God is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I don't know what I thought God was before you came, but you, you are an exaltational expositor. You, you are constantly exalting and magnifying the name of God and then all of the other areas of theology that are um, inseparably connected to theology proper. And so it's like the tide coming in and just lifting up all the driftwood that, that as, um, as you preach, um, it, it, it is, uh, J.I. Packer said about Lloyd-Jones' preaching that it was electrifying because there was so much of God in the sermon. So that, that's really at the heart of theology in exposition, and it becomes almost like the, the, the steel girders of a skyscraper. It, it's what is giving the support to, to everything that you have to say. Yeah. Dr. Thomas, you have been training ministers for a long time alongside your pulpit work. Talk about your priority in teaching them to be theologians. Uh, what are your concerns when you're teaching ministers or future ministers uh, historic theology what are you concerned about infusing in them, entrusting to them as they're going to be preaching the Word of God, but you're going to equip them for a lifetime of theological study? Yeah, I'm, I'm still 
in awe of what Steve has just said, and it all just comes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there are different levels of theology. So there's there's exposition, getting the grammar and the structure and what's dominant and what isn't dominant and getting the flow of the passage and, and we have folk like Dr. Schreiner uh, who has wonderfully uh, helped me uh, at that level um, reading his commentary on Romans but but my discipline has been systematic theology so so there's biblical theology and uh, and then there's systematic theology there's historical theology um, I, I tell my students that I'm not interested in theology that cannot be preached. Mm. Now, that doesn't narrow it as much as you might think. So when, when, when the four volumes of Bavink, when I went to seminary, Bavink was, was taught, but it was because I had Dutch professors who translated the Dutch into English and g gave us juicy quotes in, in class. But now, in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a sort of Bavink revival, mm -hmm. and his four volumes um, have been translated. I, I could not read volume one, his prolegomena. It's too long, <laughs> it's too esoteric. I just read the last paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> now the other three volumes I read closely and will reread. Yeah. Um, and the problem with Bavink is uh, that he's 19th century. Hmm. So he doesn't cover Karl Barth. He, he doesn't cover um, all, all the issues of liberalism of the 20th century. There are vast things that have happened in the 20th century um, that you won't find in Bavink. Uh, so you need, you need an up-to-date systematic theology. Yeah. And, uh, if I, if I was to choose just one, um, I would choose Bob Lethem's. Mm. Um, it's, it's written in a wonderful style. It's, it's not actually written like a typical systematic theology. There's a lot of personal anecdotes in it. And it's a little quirky. Um, Bob has a penchant for uh, Eastern Orthodox issues, and so he he delves a little there, helpfully, mostly. Um, but my concern about students, I'm not sure what to make of it. When I went to seminary, my, my generation bought books. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of books. It, and, and, you know, in my first charge, I wasn't, I wasn't paid a whole lot, but I whatever extra I had, I, I bought books. Uh, I would deny myself a whole lot of things because I needed books. And then along comes the internet and most of my colleagues at, at the church I've just been serving in, they don't buy books. They haven't bought a book since they graduated from seminary. Hmm. And they tell me, oh yes, but I, I, I read Kindle. But I'm not convinced of, of that. <laughs> you know, there's nothing like buying a recently published book and sitting down and, and over the next couple of days reading it, mm. Mm, skimming over certain sections that are quite sort of predictable, but, but then finding something that's really, really helpful, an insight that you've not thought about before. And, and that's, my, that's my concern. I, I, you know, you... you you buy Logos, you've got a ton of books. Um, I have Logos, but I have no idea what I've got. I mean, <laughs> none. I, I have never opened a book in Logos. <laughs> um, I think we could have a good conversation here between Andy and Derek. <laughs> you, could, you could provide IT help. <laughs> I, I am beyond help. <laughs> Andy wants to help. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Schreiner, thank you, Dr. Thomas. I think it's helpful to hear your perspective on inf infusing rich theology into a modern student with all the challenges that we face. Dr. Schreiner, you're a, uh, a famed exegete. We're all beneficiaries of your work in the text. And uh, Dr. MacArthur says that theology 
is supposed to serve as guardrails for the preacher uh, to keep him in, in, on track, on the right road while he's working through a text. Um, when I think of your ministry and, and your contribution, uh, help us think about that relationship between preaching the text and ensuring we let the text speak and not being um, distracted by theological hobby horses. What do you find most helpful as an expositor and someone who trains expositors to pay close attention to the text so that they, the agenda isn't their agenda, but the text's agenda? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in terms of theological hobby horses, I, I think you're going to avoid that if you're actually preaching the text. Yeah. You're, you're, you're going to let the text speak. So at, at one, uh, clearly the text needs to af- inform what we're, what we're preaching and teaching. But at the same time, uh, systematic theology, I believe, reflects the understanding of the church throughout history of what the entire canonical witness is telling us. And we need to listen to that witness, uh, as it's been mediated, of course, through the early councils and creeds, but also through the Reformation. And if if we say, all right, I don't agree with what is being said there, we're almost certainly wrong. Hmm. I mean, if if a preacher is going to go against the, the, the tradition, by that I mean the early councils, you know, Chalcedon and Nicaea, or, or what we see in the Reformational tradition. Of course, I know there are some differences there on, on things like baptism. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I think we, should, we would say to ourselves, what are the guardrails? Probably, almost certainly, our exegesis has gone astray. Yeah. So we don't want to go to a theological hobby horse, but in, in a sense, that's just respecting the great interpreters Who've, uh, who've gone before us as well. Good. Andy, how would you contribute to that? You, you have a PhD in theology and a PhD in New Testament. And in your teaching at Bethlehem, you're training guys both ways. You're, you're teaching them to be able theologians and apt exegetes. Uh, what are your concerns when you think about making sure, especially that their, their work in the pulpit isn't ivory tower esoteric, but it's practical and pastoral? Mm-hmm. How, how would you bring those two things together? Yeah, uh, and I, I was teaching New Testament primarily for years before I switched over to systematics about five years ago. So now I teach primarily systematic theology, but it's I'm building on all the training for exegesis. Um, that's actually, when they invited me to teach this class this week, they said, do you want to teach a class on Romans? I said I could do that, and, and those are great classes to have. What would you think of doing a class, I've never heard of one like this before, where we show how that book contributes to systematic theology. So that's what I'm teaching this week. It's, they're calling it exegetical theology of Romans. Mm-hmm. It's how Romans contributes to systematic theology. So what we're doing is we're building on sound exegesis and then showing how that contributes to about 25 or 26 significant doctrines in systematic theology. Just this last hour, we were in Romans 5, 12 to 21, talking about imputation and original sin. And I show the students a, a survey of chapter 15 of your book on faith alone where you talk about aberrant views on imputation by N.T. Wright and others, and show how the doctrine of imputation might not be as explicit as some are looking for in the text, but when you look at texts like Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 1 and Philippians 3 and 2 Corinthians 5, and then you, you say, well, if that's true and that's true and that's true and that's true, what does that necessarily logically imply? You get double imputation. Christ's righteousness is credited to us. That's, so Tom is an unusual exegete who's, he's not just with tunnel vision, I'm in this text, so I'm not going to think about anything else. Tom's a model for, I'm in this text, I'm, I'm tracing this text carefully, and I'm able to zoom out and show how it relates to the whole thing. That's my burden when I'm training students, is that they're able to do that exegetical work. That Greek and Hebrew training is so important. Don't want to ever minimize that. But that's not the end. That's that's enabling you to get to the end, which is to understand the whole picture and glorify God in light of all of that. Good. Uh, you men have seen over your years of ministry uh, cases of dangerous theological drift 
in those who maybe you were close to or even men you've trained? Uh, are there warning signs that you could give to seminarians or pastors uh, who uh, something they need to be aware of? Is there is there something that you've seen uh, that is a concern in theological drift? Does it does it appear? Are there any symptoms that appear beforehand? Question for the panel, whoever feels like they can contribute to that or, or help us understand how to guard against theological drift. Yeah, I, I would say, I, I think in at least some cases, maybe many cases, from, from students, some who are dear friends of mine who have drifted, I think in the academy, there's a desire to please uh, the academic guild. And uh, I've, I've seen that exert an in influence on people where they've moved away from, from the historic teaching of the faith. And, and you go study with someone, that, that can be a great privilege. You, one can learn a lot, but there can be an incredible pull upon a person to move away from the faith once for all delivered to the saints because of a desire to fit in. C.S. Lewis talks about this, doesn't he? It's the inner ring. Mm -hmm. We want to be part of the inner ring. And that, and that force is, uh, is so powerful. So when, when students go study at a place that is not fully evangelical, I'm, I'm happy about it, but I'm also concerned because I, I, th I think those, uh, the pressures, they're, they're, they're significant, and I've seen it happen so many times, too many times. Yeah. Next Tuesday, I'm planning to preach here in chapel and tell the story of George Ladd. It's a very sad story, <laughs> illustrating his very point he just made. Uh, my short answer to your question would be that today, what I think is the canary in the coal mine for theological drift is aberrant sexual ethics. There are a lot of ways you can do this with LGBT affirming inclusivity, wrong views on manhood and womanhood, wrong views on abortion, or not ever wanting to offend people on certain issues like that. If, if you're off on sexual ethics today, that just tips me off. You're on a trajectory that's going to reject a whole lot more. It's good work. You go first. <laughs> Well, what flashes to my mind, I'm thinking of a leading seminary uh, in the world, um, in our country, that went adrift. And as I was an observer, it really went back to equivocating on original sin. And it was like that started... Um, a slippery slope. I, I think historically, you know, it could be a departure from the doctrine of Scripture itself, inspiration and inerrancy, which sets you on a course, but even then I saw professors who held to Scripture and were would defend it ably, but they couldn't interpret the Scripture correctly. And just my limited observation was the linchpin. Once that linchpin was pulled out on original sin, that it affected all of theology. And I was a systematic theology major, so I was really keen on some, a lot of the nuances of this. But in going from, let's say, Augustinian to being semi-Pelagian, set the school on a course that then uh, became soft on women preachers and women pastors and soft on lordship and repentance. And I, I would really trace that stream back up river to going soft on original sin. When, once you have original sin nailed, total depravity, radical corruption, it, it, it's, it's like nailing something to the wall that, you know, unconditional election and 
a monergistic regeneration is necessitated. So you really give up the high ground. Um, so that's just my observation. Um, and not every institution is the same and not every departure of a preacher is the same. Yeah. But if, if you're not strong on original sin, you've just opened the floodgates. And it's just a matter of time. How much water is going to come through that floodgate and drown the rest of your theology? It weakens uh, the primacy of preaching. Um, it, 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 it lets in other things into the room. And all of a sudden now, we're all about counseling. We're all about um, audiovisual. We're all about overheads. We're all, I mean, there, there, there's a lot that comes in with that, that lead snake. Hmm. There are other snakes then that, that come in behind it. Yeah. Um, so anyway. No, that's helpful. So the, we're talking about drift, and Dr. Schreiner has identified novelty, you know, being accepted in academic circles as, as one uh, concern. Dr. Nacelli, you, you see it as the cultural idols of the day can, can lead to compromise. Dr. Lawson, you're talking about these, these root doctrines concerning man and you know, core historic doctrines and, and holding on to those. Dr. Thomas, what would you add to that mix in concern about theological drift, either in a, yeah. a student or a pastor? Um, so my, my life, my 50 years of ministry has always been in a confessional church. Mm -hmm where um, the denomination required um, a vow to be made uh, to the Westminster standards. And although they would occasionally allow scruples, uh, they did not uh, necessarily allow any exceptions. And so, um, you know, there are, there are lots, I've known too many who have drifted mm. uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, students who went to do PhDs in, in secular universities who either didn't have the ability to withstand the liberal pressures that came upon them from their advisor, or they, they didn't have the will to um, radically oppose whatever their advisor was saying, and and so I've, sadly, I've seen I've seen um, students drift from the reformed faith. Yeah. Um, I I think I think the toxicity of um, social media. I'm I'm alarmed by just how toxic. You know, re reformed clubs or, or or groups on social media. I I've long time gave up reading them, but I was um, I was amazed just how willing they were were online using anonymous names um, to dabble with views that are, were clearly wrong. Mm. Um, I mean, one of the important things, I mean, there are lots of important things, but one of the important things is is not to see ministry as a profession and Piper's book. And I, I've never read Piper's book, but I've, I've, I know the title, and I think I know what he's saying. <laughs> um, one day I'll, I'll read it, but... Um, <laughs> not on Kindle. You know, you... you <laughs> You become a sermon machine. If you, if you're if you're a senior minister somewhere, and you're on, on the conference stage, you're producing four or five messages a week. Mm -hmm. And whilst whilst that can become easier as time goes on, because you know a whole lot more, and and you've you've preached on these passages before, although I've, I I don't preach old sermons. Um, for that very reason, uh, that it would so easily then just become a profession. And I, w I want to love the truth. I want to love the word. 
I want to be excited every time I'm in a certain passage. Um, I love sermon preparation. I love it more than preaching. Uh, I get really excited when I'm, I'm, I go to my office and I'm, I'm, I, the next two or three hours I'm doing sermon prep and looking at the, at the text in, in Greek and Hebrew, whatever my abilities are, uh, getting help from people like, like uh, Dr. Schreiner, um, asking constantly, what is, what is this text saying to me? What, what's the implication of this text to me? And I, and I think keeping that close relationship uh, with the Lord uh, 40, 45, 50 years into ministry. Um, I, I asked Sinclair Ferguson this question 10 years ago. We, we were, we were, I, w I was the evening preacher when he was the senior minister. And I said, Sinclair, how long does it take you to prepare a sermon? And he said, well... If, if I don't have an outline after 45 minutes, it's going to be a long day. Mm. And I knew exactly what he meant. Mm. It, you, once you have the outline, you, you can preach that sermon. It may not be the best sermon in the world. It may not have a, not have a fancy introduction. Uh, it may not have all the best illustrations that you could have. But it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to preach the text. Um, I've, I've drifted now from your question, so I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> we were enjoying the ride, though, <laughs> without a doubt. Let's, let's talk about some specific uh, theological controversy, um, the one that comes to mind, and I'd like us to talk about some lessons uh, learned from it, is uh, one that was the intersection of... Uh, theology proper and uh, the kind of the practical outworking of men and women's roles. There was a dust up a number of years ago about the Trinity. Um, and I wonder if, if we can look back on that a little bit and see if there's some, some lessons learned about navigating theological controversy. Dr. Thomas, you wanna, wanna think about that a little bit with us? And uh, we don't need to walk through the entire ordeal, but kind of in the rear view mirror, what are some lessons that we need to uh, hang on to that will help us navigate future theological controversies? Uh, but I'd, I'd like you to start us off on that. Yeah, I, th I, th I think that controversy, and there are others that I could think of, um, began by, by trying to engage the doctrine of the Trinity from, from scratch, as though as though there hadn't been 2,000 years of debate about certain issues. And I think that if, if, you, if you are not subject to the findings of Nicaea in 325, if you're not subject to the findings of Chalcedon in 451, you're, you're, you're in for a rocky ride. Yeah. Because the church has discovered... A, a, up until, the, up until a few years ago, the church, um, there is no debate about the doctrine of the Trinity in the Westminster Confession. It, it took the doctrine of the Trinity that had been around for a thousand years. It didn't, it didn't change it. It didn't add to it. There's no debate in the Westminster Confession on the person of Christ. Now, there's a lot of debate about the work of Christ in the, in the Westminster Confession, but the doctrine of the person of Christ was the Roman Catholic doctrine of the person of Christ. It was the medieval doctrine. It was Augustine's doctrine. It was, Cal it was Chalcedon. Mm -hmm. it, was, it has 451 written all, all over it. And I think having... Um, th that's where historical theology is so important. That, that you, you... It's unthinkable to me that you can come up with a view of Christology that undoes Chalcedon. That's un unthinkable to me. It's, it's arrogant in the extreme. Yeah. Andy, you and I were talking uh, recently about this is something that we, uh, with most evangelicals, encountered and had to consider our own position, what we were taught, and where we were at on this thing. And uh, thanks to, you know, some valiant Presbyterian friends, you know, 
helping us through uh, the kerfuffle, uh, made it through the other side. Talk a little bit about how, how you process uh, undergoing theological scrutiny, change, when you have to examine something that you've either maybe believed wrongly or haven't believed carefully. Uh, just in that example, we want to Give us kind of a fill in your, your version of that story. Yeah, and real quickly, I don't want to assume all of you know what we're talking about. Some of you might be lost. Like, what, what is true. the controversy? So, in a true. nutshell, the debate is whether the Trinity, apart from creation, has a particular relationship among their members, specifically the Father and Son, is the Son, God the Son, eternally submitting to God the Father? That's the question. So no one's debating whether in Jesus' incarnate state, whether he's submitting to the, to the Father in his earthly ministry. Everyone says, yes. The question is, is he submitting eternally, going backwards, and going forward? In the Godhead. Right, right. To, to God the Father. So that, that, that's what the debate's about. And uh, I had been trained by some really godly men, men you would know, like a, like a Wayne Grudem, uh, who were arguing for that view, and I hadn't heard an opposing view. So for many years, I just assumed that was the traditional view, and Derek's over there thinking I'm crazy, and I should, <laughs> I should get out more. I should read more. Uh, he's, see, he is. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what helped me uh, develop here is the 2016 controversy when it blew up online, and I realized that I was uh, my hermeneutic was uh, simplistically, reductionistically biblicist. Now, my my theological method is pretty biblicist, meaning I want to root everything I believe in the Bible. But there's a way to do that that's simplistic, where you want to say, I believe this, so I need a passage that says exactly that, explicitly that. And if I don't have a connection that's direct, then I don't believe it, or I reject it. And that, I think, is simplistic, because even Jesus, when he rebukes the Sadducees in one point, he rejects them, saying, you should believe in the resurrection, because Old Testament says, I am the Father. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You should be able to take that truth and deduce that they're still that God is still their God, and that therefore they're alive, and the resurrection is real. Like, whoa! That that requires logic. That requires making inferences. That requires critical thinking, and God holds us accountable for that. And thankfully, we don't have to do it in a vacuum. When the church has been doing this for centuries, and hasn't disagreed on it, it's a mark of humility and wisdom to say, okay. What have I missed? What did they say? Uh, let me study that. Let me learn from that. And be very, very wary of being the one guy who says, nope, I got it figured out. So 2016 caused me to rethink it, go back to some more ancient sources and study, and say, okay, I got that one wrong. And that's okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't think brothers like Wayne Grudem are heretics, but I don't think that that's the most persuasive view. Uh, you talked about this in class yesterday, this, this topic, and uh, you encounter it uh, through text and theology intersecting. So talk about your experience in that, maybe even a, a lesson here about growing uh, or changing your view as you encounter it in the Bible or as another brother comes to you and, and convinces you through his writings, that, that sort of thing. Talk about a mature approach to um, admitting that you're wrong on something or changing your view or your position how do you think about that in light of this this issue? Yeah. Well, the first the first thing I want to say is I really agree with Dr. Thomas and Dr. Nacelli. I I I'd, I'd want to double down and say I think there was a naivete present, and we need to recognize that the early believers, when they wrestled, if you read about those early Trinitarian controversies, early controversies about the person of Christ, they're wrestling with Scripture. And they're wrestling with Scripture profoundly mm. and deeply, and which, which is why I think what was happening was naive, because those who were teaching such, and I, I agree with Andy, not, I, I don't think they're heretical because they will confess the, in the, the Trinity, but I think it's defective, and so so we 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 need to we need to recognize when we come to uh, the these matters that those who have preceded us. This is what I was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. They have done careful exegetical and theological work, and it is 
arrogant for us, uh, for us to ignore those who've gone before us. I, th I think that's a danger, a danger especially among those of us who are Baptists. I'm a Baptist. There can be a danger to leap from the biblical writings to our era and, and, and ignore everything in between. So that, that, that is an area, I think, in which we're growing. Clear, clearly, Scripture is the uh, final norm, isn't it? Uh, so now, now, in terms of your question, at least I think at the same time, I'm, I'm not saying something like the Trinity or uh, Chalcedon, but in our own work as, as preachers, as teachers of the Bible, we, we always want to be humble. We want to say our, our vision is, uh, is uh, partial. That's, that's why we need the whole church and the, uh, those who've gone before us. And at least, I, I hope I've made, kept this vow, I just said to myself when I was young and I started writing, I don't. I don't want to be so proud that if I've written something, I'm not open to being corrected. And I'm not open to changing my mind. Now, not on something like the Trinity, right? But clearly, especially if you write a lot and, and you're writing when you're younger, which I did, clearly there's things... And I'm not saying now that I'm old, I've got it right. But there's clearly things that um, one writes that might be wrong. <laughs> so, uh, and and that, that's where we learn where we learn from others. That's one of the I've learned so much from teaching, from questions from students. And and I want to, I would just say, a, a good stance for all of us is let's really hear our critics. Let's listen to those who disagree with us. They may still be wrong, but maybe there's a part of what they're saying even that might be helpful to us, that might be a corrective, which we can adjust our view to some, to some extent. Yeah. So. Good, yeah, and the humility and a submission to the text and the wisdom of, of those who've gone before us. Dr. Lawson, you talked in class this week about uh, your change in views, which was a Copernican revolution about uh, God and and. Calvinism and you know all, all those doctrines coming together and, and for you it wasn't a light matter uh, it was uh, early on in your ministry but it, it led to a massive change uh, talk a little bit about how that change wasn't instantaneous or overnight yeah I, I came from a Southern Baptist church uh, I was under Adrian Rogers at Bellevue Baptist Church is where I was called in to the ministry and then sat under W.A. Criswell for five years uh, at First Baptist Dallas. Uh, Criswell, I remember when he came to chapel, told us that he's a Calvinist of the highest, lowest, and middle order. <laughs> we didn't really understand exactly what that meant. Um, but I came from a very Arminian background, not even knowing what Arminianism is. Arminianism is, and when I first heard of the doctrines of grace being taught in class, I mean, it provoked quite a response in me. And then I was attending um, another church also, after I would hear Dr. Criswell preach, then I would hear S. Lewis Johnson preach. And he was strong on this. And it, for two years, I mean, I wrestled with this. I mean, I lived by myself. I was not married. I ate every meal by myself. I had a lot of private time to think. And it took me two years to go from point A to point B. And really, I remember the day in class when the professor asked the question. We were studying the preaching of George Whitfield. He asked the question... What can a dead man do? And this kind of goes back to the original sin question. And the silence in class was just deafening because I kept waiting for someone to answer this. And someone in the back row just said, stink. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing a dead man can do is stink. And it was like a rock thrown through a 
large glass window that just took the whole window down. And I, I was stunned. And it was kind of like the missing link in the chain of thought was now there. And it, it had a dramatic effect on my life. Because to that point, I was putting myself through seminary by writing magazines with the Dallas Cowboys and the Texas Rangers, and it was a whole lot more fun than going to Hebrew class. I mean, it was a whole lot more fun to hang out with the Cowboys, and this is literally what I'm doing, and all of a sudden, the realization of the truth of the sovereignty of God, it hit me so hard that it made me think God has chosen me for something. And I cannot squander my life or waste my life on just what I want to do at a pretty trivial level that God has, it, it, it awakened me, it shook me out of my slumber. And it was easy just to operate in fun things in the world. Um. And so I remember for the next three months, I don't think I even hardly opened my mouth because I've been so wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I was like a sphinx um, because I'd been so wrong for so long. Where else am I wrong? And then someone entered, and then I'm reading Body of Divinity, Thomas Watson, and I read the chapter on Providence. It's like, oh, my word. I mean, what else do I need to know? Where, where has this been? So it, it dramatically changed me, but it put, it, I, I just, I didn't even know you could sell a business. I, I just shut the whole thing down. Yeah. And I went from the back pew in class or the back row in class to sitting in the front row in class. And I realized for the rest of my time in seminary, if God is sovereign, and he has chosen me from before the foundation of the world, and he has also prepared good works for me to walk in, and I only have a limited amount of time, and I had just read Jonathan Owens, uh, Jonathan Edwards' sermon on redeem the time, that I needed to absorb everything I could in the remaining year here at seminary and just burn my bridges completely behind me. I mean, it had that kind of a dramatic effect. And at that time, if you were Reformed, there, there was no place to go. I mean, nobody really knew who John MacArthur was or R.C. Sproul was, barely knew James Montgomery Boyce. And so if you were Reformed, I mean, it, 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 was, a, it, it was a tough day to try to find a place, especially in a Baptist church. Uh, unless it's a little Reformed Baptist church of, you know, six people meeting in a closet mm -hmm. um, and just staring at their navel. Um, and, but it, it gave me the confidence. It, it gave me the strength and stability that I needed to face opposition even within the church. And I immediately then read Forgotten Spurgeon by Ian Murray. And all of the controversies that, that Spurgeon was up against. And I was like, who wouldn't want to be Spurgeon? And then all of a sudden you see the price of being Spurgeon, who eventually dies of a broken heart. Um, but anyway, just looking back on that time, that was the game changer for me. It was almost like being saved all over again. I mean, it became a continental divide. Yeah. Um, and it put me, it got me out of this line and got me in this line, and, and, and I stood with men who were giants, who had impacted continents and eras. Yeah, and, and I think that's why it's such a, a great illustration of that submission ultimately to the Word of God and going through that process of, of self-examination and necessary change and watching the Lord work through those who've gone before us, through his word, working in conjunction with his spirit to change us. So thank you, men, for helping us navigate that. Let's do a modern theological topic. Uh, if we talked about kind of how to think about the, the dust up over the Trinity in the rearview mirror, the, probably the question you get asked when you travel any place these days is, 
what do you think of Christian nationalism? Andy, you probably get asked that the most because of your beard. Um, so you, you look, brother, like a Christian nationalist, uh, obviously. So, so let's, let's have you start. When people say, you know, I mean, people, usually people don't know what they're even asking when they're asking about Christian nationalism, but they've, they've read it on Twitter or they've heard that it's a, maybe an eschatological position or that we're gonna, Christians are going to eventually you know, win and take over the country or the school board or at least their cul-de-sac. What, what do you think of when somebody asks you, you, know, what, do you what do you think about, Dr. Desele, Christian nationalism? Yeah, uh, I actually just spent uh, about five or six months focused on government, politics, how government and religion relate. Have you heard of ChristOverall.com? It's a relatively new website that Steve Wellerman, David Schrock, and some others are leading. Yeah. I really like those guys. And I think in October, November, they devoted a bunch of articles to this issue. And one of them is an article I wrote on, it's a proposal of a taxonomy, seven views on the relation of government to religion. And then they, they interviewed, they did 12 podcast interviews on this. And then I, my job was to listen to them all and write a reflection article. It's, I think it's called 12 Reflections on 12 Interviews on Christian Nationalism. So you can check that out if you want more thoughts here. But the gist is, I don't take that label and apply it to myself because it's like walking into a church and saying, hey, I'm a Calvinist, and you don't know anything about the people you're talking to. Like They, they might hear that to mean... Oh, you think evangelism's not necessary. You hate people. You, uh, they, they might think all kinds of crazy things. I wanted to find my terms. And since that term is so flexible and so imprecise and so, so not clear, I don't think it's helpful to use. Yeah. I mean, you could say, well, I'm a Christian, and I prefer nationalism over globalism and tribalism, so yeah. Right. But it's, it's so many people claim the term, I find it more helpful to just stop and describe your view rather than say, yeah, I'm one of those. Talking about one specific aspect instead of just mm -hmm. sort of a, a broad sweeping yeah. thing. How, how does a Christian relate to right. local governance? And how yeah. does a Christian relate to, you know, how, how is our mission fulfilled? Mm -hmm. that, that, those, so those kind of questions rather than right. just a, a blanket answer. And my, my burden right now in talking to friends in these circles and my circles, they're, they're very strong opinions about what the right view is on the relation of government and Christianity. And I'd rather us not prematurely cancel each other right now over our differences on that. I'm the, I'm the conscience guy. Remember, I wrote a book on conscience. I'm always trying to like, okay, what can, what can we not have to separate over? And I think right now it'd be great if we could band together and say, uh, let's agree that, that mutilating our children is bad. That, can we agree on that? Can we all oppose that? Uh, let's uh, you know, let's pick some issues that are like abortion is evil. Can we pick issues that are ravaging our country, and agree that we should oppose those? If we just all splinter right now over, well, I think the best possible endpoint is here, not there. Uh, we'll become weaker. So okay. that's one of my burdens. Okay. Other thoughts about how you'd answer that question if you've encountered it with people in your churches? It's it's not a term. That is used in the circles that I move in. Yeah. I, that's, that's how Dr. MacArthur answered that I, question the other day. And I daren't go into uh, the realm of eschatology. I, I made a promise I'm not <laughs> going there. Um, so whether the good guys win I, I, eventually? I think we all agree on that point. Eventually? Yeah, yeah. yeah. amen. Um, I mean, the way in which... Um, Christianity and politics, or Christianity and government, or Christianity and nationhood relate, there would be massive differences of, of opinion, yeah. e even in historical reformed communities. The Dutch would have a certain view, right. the English would have a certain view, the Scots would have a certain view. I'm a Brit, so I don't dabble into American politics. I, actually, I'm a, a citizen now, but. Um, I'm st I'm still a little wary, um, but I'm 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 happy with the idea that the the norm and the standard for government is the Ten Commandments. Uh, that there has to be some basis of what is just, what is right, what is wrong. 
um, a sort of Judeo-Christian basis for government, um, so that it's not. I, I mean, we're in a we're in a different world now, uh, where where there are no norms. N no nothing is right. Nothing is wrong. Truth is whatever you want to make it. Justice is whatever you want to make it. Uh, so it's, it has become deeply sectarian and and personal. Um, so I th I think this is an issue that the church will have to address. The the problem that that I have, and, and maybe it's not a problem. I mean, I've, I've been ministering in the South, in South Carolina. Uh, the governor, who's a Republican, is a member of the church. He's there every Sunday. He sits up in the balcony, takes notes. I look up to my right, and he's there every su Sunday. Um, makes a very, very strong profession of faith. And... But if, if you are anti-abortion, you, there are two genders, you're anti-gay marriage, you sound like a Republican. And so, and so when you preach biblical ethics as the norm for society, it, it's very hard unless, unless you take a position you know, that, that abortion is, is not the number one issue. M maybe something else is the number one issue. And you can, and you can um, vote for a Democrat just because you've, you've put abortion in s sort of down here and something else, whatever that something else is, has taken priority. Um, I've said enough. Get get us out of the quagmire here and and into the clear light of Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I agree. I, I think defining, as Andy said, Christian nationalism is it is hard for me even to put my arms around the whole issue. For me, it even goes back to again, original sin. I don't think we're ever gonna have a Christian nation. I don't think we've ever had a Christian nation. So we were not Christian at the time our country was founded. There were Christians there, and there were Christians in places of um, leadership. There were those who were deists. There were those who were Catholics. There were those who were outside of the faith, who were in leadership from the very beginning. So we were never... Uh, a new Jerusalem, and so is that's why I mean I could never be a post millennialist. Uh, that the world is going to get better and better, and will usher in the kingdom. Um, the doctrine of original sin will not permit it. That we will always be in the minority. Uh, the way is narrow, and few that be that shall find it. I mean, there's a certain reality about that. And we will always be a pluralistic society. Um, it cannot be anything other than that, uh, unless we become a police state, and we and and we are forced, like Constantine, to just declare the entire nation Christian and saved. And that's even a worse solution. So democracy cannot work uh, apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, if those people are reprobates, it, it, it just can't even work. Uh, you would rather have a benevolent dictator than a democracy if you have reprobate people. So our job is very clear. <laughs> it is to preach the gospel and to win souls to Christ and to realize we will never usher in the kingdom. It's impossible because of the doctrine of original sin. And we're, ne we're never going to get everyone in the entire nation converted. Th that's a, a misreading of Scripture. So I, I just think there needs to be a certain theological realism 
that begins not with just eschatology, but it begins with anthropology and hermitology and soteriology and theology proper. And, you know, for whom did Christ actually die? Um, I don't think we can pull off a Christian nation. Uh, I don't think we can pull off a Christian Senate, uh, uh, pull off a Christian uh, Supreme Court, pull off a Christian House of Representatives. Um, so I, I just think it's, it's, it, you're, you're, you're putting your money betting on a losing hand. Um, I think we should preach the gospel and try to win souls to Christ and pray for those in leadership over us. And I would agree with Dr. Thomas, the, the Ten Commandments, the, really the primacy of the Ten Commandments in civil uh, life and civil government, you know, could it be returned back into the courtroom? Uh, sure, it's possible. But we've also have to have uh, regenerated hearts and the fear of God for it to work. That's just my humble opinion. Okay, Dr. Shrine, you want to add something? Uh, well, just quickly, it's a, it is super complicated. But two authors I would recommend reflecting my biases. I think David Van Drunen is a very helpful author to read, and Jonathan Lehman. So read them, see what you think. Yeah, and I think, you know, in light of all that we've talked about, it's, it's a helpful way for our students and these pastors to navigate these issues, knowing that they're not alone on this. They have friends dead and alive who are going to help them walk through these things, and the scriptures are going to be clear, and our mission is going to be crucial and forefront in all of it. Let's conclude by just letting the guys know what you're working on. What, what project do you have upcoming, and then we'll, we'll wrap up but thank you for your time. We, we do want to hear uh, what's, what's under the hood, what's upcoming, uh, something being published. What project can we look forward to from each of you? Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I'm going to be working over the next month on finishing the edits for a book called How to Read a Book, Advice for Christian Readers, coming out with Logos Press around March or April. So Great. that's the next thing. I, I'm doing an exegetical and theological commentary on Ephesians with uh, Baker. It's definitely not coming out next month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, golf. <laughs> golf. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I've just retired. Um, I have a book coming out in the next month or two on the life of Peter. And my goal over the next couple of years, uh, I gave 85 or 90 lectures covering the whole gamut of systematic theology. Um, and I want to write that up as a book for, for office bearers in church, not at that level, not, not a systematic theology for seminary students, but, but at a slightly lower level. Dr. Lawson, what are you working on? Yeah, I, I just submitted yesterday for typeset um, volume one of a commentary on Romans. It's called Preaching Romans. And um, 52 chapters on Romans one through eight. And so in two weeks, I'll start back up on volume two, which will be due um, next November. Um, and so it's kind of the elephant in the room for me that's uh, standing on my air hose. Yeah. So my, my life is consumed with yeah. writing this on Romans. Yeah. Well, we're grateful for all four of you men. Thank you for your time today, your contribution, your influence on all of our lives. Let's, let's thank these men for their time. <laughs> Andy, will you close us in prayer? Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study with brothers to learn better how to exegete and apply your words to us. We want to stand before you someday and hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. We want to work hard for your approval. Help us to do that.
we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.